Troy Downing. I'm the Montana State Auditor, or the Commissioner of Securities and Insurance. And we're here today to talk about FAST, the Financial Abuse Specialist Team. And sitting with me today, I have Mark Mattioli, who's our uh, Deputy Chief Legal Counsel, and Chris McConnell, who's also on our legal team, to talk about uh, issues with um, elder elder justice, elder abuse, you know, you know, particularly financial abuse of our senior members in Montana. So, uh, Chris and Mark, thanks for sitting with me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. One of the things a lot of people may not realize is Montana has the oldest population per capita in the western state. So we're uh, an aging population here. And we estimate somewhere near 75% of the fraud that we investigate here involves seniors. And so that's really you know, come to our attention. We've heard some estimates that uh, up to a billion dollars in losses, financial losses uh, from seniors due to fraud uh, have experienced, uh, been experienced by Montanans. And so it really, really caught our attention here. And early on in my tenure, so probably close to a year and a half ago, we looked at uh, reconvening the Elder Justice uh, Task Force. And that's what started um, with our Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council, which had you know, quite a bit of success going up into you know, 2020. And so we, re we reconvened that. And uh, you know, luckily, I've got you know, some folks here that uh, were involved in that. So uh, Chris, can you just tell us a little bit how that, uh, that task force started and how the Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council started? Yes, I can. When originally this office had a working group of people, individuals not only here but also at the Department of Justice and other stakeholders who saw a need for, here, uh, for this kind of investigation. And so we worked, had these working groups in Billings and decided instead of having just five different groups doing the same thing, we need to come together and have a centralized team. And that's how the Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council started there in Billings took all those working groups and put them together and then broke them down by committee to tackle issues of prevention, intervention, and prosecution. Right. And how, how did that go uh, with that Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council? What, what was your experience there? We've had a great experience. And I was part of the, uh, an ex officio member on the team through the Department of Justice at that time and now through uh, the state auditor's office. And I was designated to be on the prosecution subcommittee so I did case reviews, investigative reviews, and we had input from local county attorney's office, local APS workers. We, we had this centralized uh, meeting every couple weeks where we would take on new cases and give perspective to local officials on, and county attorneys on how that investigation would be conducted better, what they should be looking at, some of the red flags, and we were able to provide that resource to those smaller counties that were looking for that advice that didn't have it before. And so we had some great successes through this office and the commissioner's office, as well as on a local level uh, for getting that information out to them and getting feedback from those stakeholders. Right, thank you. And uh, so you'd mentioned your, your prior experience in this. So for, for both of these, and I'll start with you, uh, Mark, um, what, what's been your experience in the space and how did, how, how did you end up here? And, and just tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I, uh, I've only been here about five months. I was very privileged to be hired by you to be your deputy chief legal counsel. The reason I was interested in working here was because of what this office has been doing in this arena. Uh, I came from the Montana Department of Justice where I'd worked for over 20 years in various capacities. And most recently, I had spent five years as the chief of consumer protection. And when I, I wasn't at consumer protection very long when this problem hit me like a ton of bricks because a very high percentage of the people that are contacting that office are elderly people who are vulnerable because they're isolated. Some of them are experiencing cognitive decline, physical problems. Uh, and um, they're lonely uh, and they're trusting. I mean, a lot of the people that contacted that office were people who, you know, grew up in a time when you could lock your door at night when you went to bed. And uh, so they were, and they're really targets because they, um, 
they possess the vast majority of wealth in this country. And I think so, that's important for people to understand is how much wealth is with our senior population. They, they, per, they have all, almost all the wealth, and, and so they're targets because they're vulnerable and, and they're the ones with the money. And we, you know, I very quickly saw some very uh, difficult situations that people had gotten themselves into that were not only injurious to them, but injurious to their families. And it, it also coincided with my own father having had some um, victimization himself and other elderly fam family members. And I became very impressed with how vulnerable older people are, even though they're legally competent. Yeah, very, I, I think we, we see a lot of uh, seniors that are, are, are very trusting. And I think there's a lot of bad actors there that take, uh, take advantage of that trust. They do. I mean, yeah. you know, one of the things that, you know, we teach people nowadays is, is if you don't recognize the phone number, don't pick up the call. Right. It's very difficult to uh, educate people in the older generations to not pick up that call. And once they start engaging with the scammers, that's when they become vulnerable. Right. Well, uh, Mark, we're, we're happy to have you on the team and, and really appreciate your, your passion for, for these issues. So, so thanks for being part of this. So, uh, Chris, a little bit about uh, how you ended up here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I've been a prosecutor most of my life, and a lot of my cases dealt with financial exploitation. Mm -hmm. And so for the eight years prior to coming over to the, uh, your office, I handled a lot of white-collar crime across the state, not just in Helena, but in Billings and other places um, in eastern Montana, and I found a need to reach out and help out the local county attorney's offices and other prosecutors there, because uh, financial crimes aren't the sexiest crimes, but it was something that we're seeing an uptick on, especially in the elderly population. Um, at one conference I was able to speak at for the county attorney's association a couple winters ago, I estimated that, hey, give it three years and your elder exploitation cases will go up by five times or 10 times. Mm -hmm. It's that prevalent these days. And from a personal perspective, both my grandfathers suffered from dementia. And so seeing that decline in the family and seeing how that impacts not only them, but also the family members and those caring for them, it brought a sense of there's something I can do here too. This is something that I'm passionate about, like Mark mentioned um, for himself and something that's worthwhile for the Montana's elderly community. Right. Well, Chris, we're happy to have you on board, too, and, and appreciate your experience there. So going, taking a step back, so we reconvened the task force and uh, um, looked at what the successes of the Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council. And uh, this was a you know, multi-agency uh, conversation where we saw value in replicating that across the state. And so it was agreed to do a, a north and south, you know, central and a western Montana Elder Justice Council. And we uh, basically got an executive order from Governor Gianforte to, to allow us to stand those up. And so one of the things that, uh, that we've identified, and, and this, uh, you know, came from, from the group but was really pushed uh, a lot from the, from the legal team, was a need to have uh, some prosecutorial, investigatorial um, uh, power there. And so that led to the financial abuse specialist team. So uh, either one of you, how, what, was the, what was the thought process and how did FAST you know, come into uh, being and start being formed there? We would still get the phone calls and the outreach from individuals and uh, law enforcement when they had these cases. So. While we didn't do any additional case reviews, what we found is that we needed an, a group that can do that. And here we thought was the perfect landing ground for that landing spot. And that being we have securities individuals, we have experts in the securities field, we have experts in the insurance field. And a lot of these uh, exploitation cases have a securities component to it. They're liquidating their retirement account to send to their bank account to then send to their, their new boyfriend or girlfriend overseas. And so while we kept on seeing that, the same way Mark mentioned over at the Office of Consumer Protection, we found that we can have a group of attorneys that are already dealing with these types of issues that can then also provide feedback and guidance and, and investigative functions 
and protective measures that county attorneys and other law enforcement agencies don't have. Right. And a lot of that does deal with the securities um, aspects, um, uh, statutes that allow us uh, certain powers that other agencies might not know about. I, I think, too, just, you know, bringing that expertise together uh, is helpful and sometimes, you know, surprisingly simple solutions to problems. Like, mm -hmm. is there somebody on the account who's listed as a trusted person who can be contacted, who's in a position to protect the person who we think is being victimized so that that harm can stop? And, you know, we, just prior to this podcast, Chris and I and our two insurance and securities investigators met to discuss several cases that we already have on our plate that we're working. We're working with APS. We're working with the financial industry to do what we can to protect these people, to identify whether they're being harmed and if they are being harmed to stop that. And in some cases, uh, we're looking forward to prosecuting the offenders. Right. And so, you know, one of the other parts is not just, you know, investigating, uh, prosecuting, but adding uh, subject area expertise for, for other groups, for law enforcement, for county attorneys. And, you know, what, what, what do those relationships look like? And how, how do you see that being handoff or, or that mentorship or that, you know, area? Of, how do you see working with other agencies and groups? I think, I think you know, we want to work collaboratively with all of our partners in law enforcement, uh, county attorneys. Um, actually, Chris and I are going to the county attorneys meeting uh, next week, mm -hmm. and this is going to be a topic on the agenda, agenda. So we want to make them aware of the resource that we can provide to help them at the investigative and prosecutive prosecution level, but also to just get the word out because this is, as you mentioned, Troy, you know, this is a huge problem. We're not going to investigate or prosecute our way out of it. We need to educate the public. We need to train law enforcement. We need to train prosecutors. And we need to educate the financial community of how important it is to report suspected abuse so that we, the people who are in a position to help people from being harmed, can do so. Right. So, you know, folks, agencies, uh, seniors, families, uh, you know, how, how, do they, how do they work with FAST? How, how does that work? Well, they just contact our office. We're getting a lot of refer referrals from the financial industry, from banks and investment advisors, and they, they contact our investigators, and then our investigators work with the FAST group to uh, solve those cases. And for individuals out there, they should just contact our office. Right. Call our phone number. Uh, email us, and um, we have a team assembled that, that wants to help and uh, start impacting this problem more than what has been the case in the last few years. Right, and uh, just uh, so we have it close by, our phone number is 444-2040, uh, our website csimt.gov. Um, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, we announced FAST a few weeks ago during the World uh, Elder Abuse Awareness Day, and uh, we were there with a bunch of other groups, agencies, talking about the problem and solutions. And I understand we've had, since really forming this group, we've had some experience. So uh, what, what, what have we seen so far? One of the things I want to mention, too, and reiterate that Mark uh, just talked about was reporting to us. And if the sooner that you can report, the better. The idea of FAST is that we'll review cases within 72 hours. We had one that just came in. Uh, yesterday and then we got the team together today to take a look at it and so the quicker we get eyes on this type of case the sooner we can have a response to the victim to the institutions and that alone I think helps industry it helps the victims it helps investigations to make sure these don't fall through the cracks right. or get stale over time right. and so we've had a couple of those already where and, and, and before so I'm gonna go we'll go back to the question I asked but just to build upon what you said and the importance of reporting you know, I understand there's often uh, a reluctance to report, and a lot of times you don't hear about um, these uh, these frauds being perpetrated. And, and what do you attribute the reasons that people aren't reporting more of these? As the recent example of a, someone who just reported that we reviewed, she was embarrassed. It took her th four years to report. Four years, wow. Four years. And so we see that a common theme throughout these cases. It's an embarrassment. 
uh, from an isolated individual. And also, th and in some cases, it's the fear of losing their autonomy. If they report it, then they're fearful that their family members will think they can't do anything uh, for their own. They have to be put in a home or somewhere else. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. And so there's that fear as well. Right. And so oftentimes the scammer, well, almost invariably the scammers will instruct the victim to remain silent, not to tell anybody that's part of the scam. Right. Um, but there's another component of reporting, and that's reporting by people who are in a position to protect the potential victims. And that oftentimes that's the bank teller, uh, the loan officer, the person who, who's managing the investment account, and withdrawals are happening at in amounts and in a pace that is not normal. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the frustrating things for me is time and time again, we've seen cases where um, we've had institutions that were very concerned about particular clients and it actually opened up files on them, but they never reported to law enforcement, to this office, to the Department of Justice, to the people who, who can investigate and, and who can help. And uh, so one of, one of our objectives of the FAST is to ramp up public education and training of bank and financial institution personnel so that they are, because the law already encourages them to report. Right. And uh, we want to emphasize that. And, and you know, we think that, the, you, know, you know, the business model over the last several decades has been, you know, the customer's always right. Um, do what the customer says. Right. Don't make the customer angry. I, I honestly believe the, the business model needs to change because right. our society has changed. And we do live in an age where you have to lock your door at night. You can't trust people. And, and, and the problem is just that big. Right. Well, one of the things that we do have in Montana is we do have report and, and delay laws on the books. Uh, maybe you could talk about that really briefly, what that means. So uh, in recent sessions of the legislature, uh, the legislature passed laws that um, basically encourage banks and uh, investment advisors to report uh, abuse to um, law enforcement, including our office. And, and they also have authority by statute to delay transactions. These same statutes give them immunity protections for reporting and delaying transactions. And so there's no financial reason why they should be concerned about reporting and we really need to work with our industry partners and the vast majority of whom are wanting to protect their customers and their families uh, to get the word out about how important reporting is because right. it's really disconcerting when you get a case and over a several month period or sometimes years, you found out that somebody has lost hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars. And, and is, is most, often the case once it's gone it's gone so having that delay to be able to stop something you know I, I think is 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 compelling but as you mentioned you know making sure that you know folks that are in the position to identify report and and move you know use that process uh, I think there's a lot more you know education and adoption that needs to happen in that space now and and you know at the Wilder, world elder justice day event you know the bank of the rockies sponsored that and the bank president was there and janelle huff from the bank of the rockies was there and they've demonstrated real leadership in this area which i think is really needed and i would encourage other banks and yeah. financial institutions to do the same right and and chris i'm not sure if we ever got to your uh experiences uh we were talking about since uh since we started fast did, did we get to that yeah we dovetailed a little bit into that where this recent romance scam that happened okay. and uh, what we've also seen is new partnership and re-energized uh, re partnership with APS. Uh, some of these cases, I've been able to contact the caseworker as well that's actively investigating it and we're partnering and bouncing ideas off of each other. Uh, what's the next step? And so we've really, you know, we've really improved that relationship, I believe. Um, and sometimes 
that can be tough from starting from scratch, but I don't think we started from scratch because we had them involved in the Eastern Montana Elder Justice Council. And so with this transition to FAST, I can see a, a seamless um, process for them to reach out to us, to contact any person on the FAST team directly, or even just calling our number. So when they know that we're available, I think we'll have more phone calls coming through. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned those romance scams. Uh, I was in a meeting with the FTC a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about the types of financial scams that they were saying among, uh, for in, with, against seniors. And by a wide margin, uh, it was mostly romance scams they were saying. And so for those who haven't heard that term before, it's generally when somebody, you know, gains confidence of, uh, of another person, usually electronically, um, you know, through the internet, on, on social media, and they often pretend they're somebody else and develop a relationship that suddenly needs money for plane tickets, for uh, uh, a house, a loan, whatever it is, and they start asking for money. And very often, the person that they were pretending to be doesn't exist, or sometimes they'll even duplicate existing people to, to gain this confidence. And a lot of these are offshore, and we've had cases in Montana where seniors have been you know, scammed in these romance schemes and liquidated uh, retirement accounts with you know, large amounts of money and sent it in cash to other countries. And that's obviously very difficult to recover. Uh, but we see a lot of that. And, you know, we'll, we'll probably do some more um, uh, talks about that in you know, another time. But uh, you know, one of the things that I wanna do right now is just uh, let the audience understand the, the scope and scale of the problem and the fact that uh, we do have a set of experts in investigating and prosecuting and helping uh, other agencies and victims uh, that have been involved in um, elder exploitation scams. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to have that housed here. It obviously makes sense. It's in our lane, you know, in terms of uh, under, as a, uh, commissioner of securities and uh, you know uh, prosecuting financial scams, security scams, and having that be our largest demographic of being seniors, it's obviously a problem and I think it makes sense for us to have that level of expertise. And so I just want to commend uh, both of you on having the leadership of putting this together and really creating a resource for you know not just victims and, and people in Montana, but other agencies that need this level of expertise and this help to, you know, to do their jobs from law enforcement to prosecutors to, um, you know, other agencies. So I, I just want to thank both of you for all the work that you've done on this. I'm excited about having this, you know, housed uh, in, in this department.